William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The best time to die, folks, is in your own good time. But uh, try arguing with a bullet. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Not every client you get is a socially upright citizen. But then the only society of angels is up in heaven. Mere mortals are honorable only to a degree. The almighty dollar being what it is. The gent who plopped beside me on the Fifth Avenue bus didn't look too kosher to me. And it wasn't only because of the scar on his cheek. I know Scarface judges. Just uh, call it my hunch. I transferred my wallet to the side pocket furthest from him. I'm not a dip friend. Second story? Wrong again. A uh, carnival show with arson as a sideline? Now, don't tell me you're in some honest trade. I am. Now, this is. You better yourself every day, friend. Begin bad and good. That's life, no? No comment. So, tell me. You think I sat next to you on purpose? I can tell when a guy does. You got me sized up by now? Not quite. Well, am I hired or no? First consider what I say. I murdered a man an hour ago. Oh, it's a fine day for it. I shot him. Now I've got him in a sack. Busy, little bee. I had the best of motives. That ought to reassure the corpse. You're a confidential investigator. Guilty. Your license makes you a technical arm of the law, sworn to uphold it. You've been reading my wall literature. It's your duty to detain and arrest me. I'm not the obliging type. Sorry. I'm getting off the bus. Getting off. Adios, amigo. Weird? Not so. I got my anonymous friend's feeler right off. Was I really confidential, he wanted to find out. Find out before he dared to hire me. His story was a fake. Done to see if I'd grab him and yell police. I'd be seeing more of him. I got to see him again in a health club and gymnasium while I was working out, shredding stomach fat in a punch bag. My friend showed up to watch me. Save some of your punch for me, Craig. Well, back with me again, huh? Park on the bench here. We'll talk. Yeah. Well, I'm parked. So? I'm Moody. Jip Moody. Jip, huh? Jip means I've got gypsy blood. Oh. You, uh, get rid of that corpse, okay? <laughs> it's only kidding you. You think? You're for me. You don't run blabbing what you hear. So glad I passed your test. Now, what's my job? Two hundred grand stolen from me five years ago. I want to get it back. Explain. Johnny Phoenix stole it from me. Phoenix? Yeah, I... I dimly recall... A company treasurer or something. An ex-con I gave a chance to work. Uh, work at what? In my company, Export-Import. Phoenix robbed my safe in Blue Town. And got caught? He was grabbed in Canada, extradited. And convicted? Uh, I'm a little hazy. Convicted, yeah. But he didn't do time. He didn't? Not in jail, I mean. He acted crazy all through the trial, kept screaming about gophers and dragonflies and some dead ant. An act? I don't know. He did wear a silver plate in his skull. And a twitch to him that closed one eye every ten seconds. Anyhow, the judge took notice. Phoenix got a mental test, dementia, something or other, a doctor called it. A uh, split personality. Yeah, that. Phoenix was not responsible for his actions. He went to an asylum. Riverhead Asylum, upstate. Comes out tomorrow. Out? Free? Yeah, it's in the papers. Here. Johnny Phoenix to Judge Sane. Freed on a show cause writ. Does he still stand trial for the original theft? No. He isn't the same guy who did the original robbery. So a doctor says. The DA agrees, so does the trial judge. Phoenix is a new man. Cured and rehabilitated. Beat that. The money was never recovered. Not a dime. 
I'm out all that. Big dough, 200 grand. No insurance? Um, I only had a fraction of it insured. Be there at Riverhead when Phoenix gets out. Stay with him. He's got the dough solid away. When he goes for it, you go for him. I'll give you 5%. Well, that's 10 grand. If money. If you get my 200 back. <laughs> I was in the Riverhead Railroad Station, upstate, right with Johnny Phoenix. He'd been freed about an hour earlier. I kept out of sight while we waited for the train. A good-looking guy, Phoenix. Bushy hair with nature's own Marcel in it. Spare, broad-shouldered, a good clothes horse, when he could get properly togged out. No pallor to his skin, you'd never know he'd been confined. Well, the train rolled in, and I watched Phoenix climb aboard. When I tried to do likewise, I found opposition. One moment, sir. Hey, let go of my arm. My authority. A bag. I'm Sims of the state police. In civvies? Yeah, I'm off duty. However, you're under arrest. For what? Molestation. A woman complained. Molestation meaning mashing? That's right. Her description of the man fits you. Well, I'd laugh, but right now I haven't got a sense of humor. Getting tough won't help. I'm a policeman myself. I'll show you credentials. Yeah, you do all that. At the station house. Are we going through with this, class? I have authority to shoot a resistor. Uh, put your gun away. I've missed my train anyhow. Well, there's a train every two hours. This train was special. Let's go see your complainant. The complainant looked like she'd had trouble with mashers since pigtail days. Blonde, cream cheek, born to wear silk. Ma'am, is this the man who annoyed you? Uh, no. They have a superficial likeness, but my annoyer was oilier, grosser, and uh, on his chin here, a cleft. Thanks for the exoneration, doll. Followed me around the station, talking at me in some strange tongue. Esperanto. Can I go now? Sorry if I caused you any inconvenience. Oh, it was nothing at all. I'm only out of probably lousy ten grand. Back at the Riverhead Station, again waiting for a train out. I tumbled to a masher mistaken identity routine I'd been caught up in. I watched for Golden Girl to come back to the station. When she did, I really molested her. Hello, doll. Uh, doll, are you out of your mind? I'm mad over you. Mad? Oh, you really mean mad. I'd like to apologize Don't for... bother, just explain it. My arm, please, you're bruising it. All right, talk. Well, the circumstances are plain. Here in the station before, a man... An oily fellow. My size, shape, wearing my clothes, as you told State Trooper Sims. Only oily, your guy. Therefore, not me. An honest mistake. Dishonest, baby. Well, what do you mean? The only person molested in this depot today was me. And you engineered it deliberately. Deliberately? Why, that's absurd. To keep me off the train, Johnny Phoenix left Riverhead on. I can't understand a word you're saying. You've got me grabbing your arm again, baby. Who are you? I can be gentlemanly, I can be very rough. Well, do we wrestle? All right. I'm Rita Phoenix. Sister or wife? Wife. Our train. We'll travel together, baby. Closer than Siamese twins. You made me lose Phoenix, but you're going to help me find him again. You're going to lead me back to him. Come on, trains don't wait. On the train, we sat as close as the law allowed. I took the precaution of searching Rita's handbag. The ivory-handled gun surprised me just a little bit. I won it in a raffle. Does that explain it? Okay if I borrow it, baby. Can I stop you? I want a drink. Ah, so do I. Can't I even go to the club car without you? We're inseparable, remember? Boy, can I get a hate on you. Inseparable. Only thing I was wishing aloud. We were going to be separated. By no choice of mine. It happened in the club car while Golden Girl was watering her tonsils with Smirnoff vodka. The fellow flopped on the lounge beside her. With a beauty like Rita available, the dope chose to sit on my side. I knew why in less than a minute. I knew by the gun in my ribs. Do I have to spell it out, Craig? G-U-N. Gun. I'm glad you're quick on the think. The feel. 
Now, this is where you leave Rita Phoenix. You've been hogging her company a long while now. You really expect me to obey? I know what you're thinking. The crowded club car, people all around us, conductors and stewards, but it won't help you, Craig. You'd have to be pretty desperate to shoot. You'd be crazy to tempt me. Dough, Craig. I drool when I think of the amount of dough at stake. All right. What's your play? That's better. The station up ahead, soon falls. We roll into it exactly 3.47. That's in four minutes. You're getting off the train. Alone? Yeah. At the station, someone's waiting for you. A friend of mine. You plan far ahead, huh? I've got a knack for detail. Uh, how do I come out in all this? You just lose a client and an opportunity. No other harm done. I lose Rita. Yeah. I lose her and she's your pigeon. Look, let's not stretch this conversation. Three minutes now and we stop. Let's start moving to where you can get off. In Suna Falls, I watch the train continue on to New York. The someone waiting to greet me was right on hand as promised. I am, pal. Put his face between two loaves of bread and you could call it a giant meat burger. Hey, what are you staring at my kisser for? It's ugly. Now, is that nice? My car's there. Is this ride necessary? Yeah, can be. Set it up. Can be, huh? Oh, did I just leak his name to you? No, 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 no. Canby's an old acquaintance. Oh. Uh, what makes this station so lonesome? No people. Sooner Falls is a hick town. Nobody in it. Well, why are you in it? For my asthma. I got asthma bad. This bug is pollen free. So let's ride now, huh? Uh, where will we ride to? Around. Just around? Yeah. You're worrying. Don't. This rod on you don't mean nothing. <laughs> no holes in you, so don't worry, huh? My orders is just to stall around with you, see the sights, run you into six o'clock, and then give you the heave. Run me into six o'clock. Until Rita and Canby land in New York, get off their train, and get lost together. Canby doesn't want me phoning ahead. Hop in, pal. Delighted to. I'd love to tour sooner for him. Hey! Oh, my throat. When your lovely face turns from beet red to purple. Let, let go. He took a long time throttling. And when he finally dropped, I fell on his gun. Fell on his gun and just lay there. I left my meat-faced friend in a semi-conscious stupor and hurried into a pay station telephone. Operator, get me long distance. New York City. Police headquarters. Person to person, reverse charges. I want to talk to Lieutenant Trav Rogers. Finally, at long last, I arrived in New York. I'd sure missed a lot of trains. Trav Rogers had come through for me at his end. The man and woman you described on the telephone got off the train here in New York. They went off in separate directions. You had them shadowed? I did. Uh, where'd they go to? The lady's registered at the Parkfront Hotel as Rita Manning. A phony name. She's Rita Phoenix. How about Candy? He checked in at the Kilgore Hotel. Kilgore? New name to me. Over in Brooklyn Heights. Oh. Rita, the Parkfront Hotel. Canby, the Kilgore. Anything else you can enlighten me on? I think so. That story of Johnny Phoenix you told me over the long-distance phone. The original theft from your client, uh... Jip Moody. The uh, subsequent trial of Phoenix, his insane behavior in court, and the resultant confinement in an asylum... Et cetera, and so forth. What can you add to it? I found a discrepancy in your tale. What? The alleged $200,000 Phoenix stole. Alleged? In my review of the record of the case, no such sum. Phoenix was booked and tried for the theft of exactly $50,000. For a fact... I have a duplicate of the district attorney's file, if you'd uh, care to see it. I'll take your word. Quite a gap between 200,000 and 50,000. A gap that can buy Boku cherries for the wine. Uh, your client magnified the figure to fire your uh, zeal as a retriever? No, Moody's queer, but not like that. 
His 200,000 figure has some other significance. What? I can't know until I put the question to Moody. Uh, Phoenix never disgorged any of the loot? Not a copic. What did the police do about it? About trying to recover the money from Phoenix, I mean. Oh, the usual devices and pressures. All we accomplished was a show put on by Phoenix. He acted nuts. Climbed the walls, screaming he was a chimpanzee in a jungle. After Phoenix's asylum confinement, what police activity about the money was there? The obvious. A police plant right on the asylum? Hoping to catch Phoenix in a rational moment? Win Phoenix's confidence? Yeah. Quite an assignment for a cop. Feigning insanity. We had to change our plants every ten days. The sheer wear and tear. <laughs> the plant began to wonder about himself, huh? Was he or wasn't he Napoleon Bonaparte? Environment, they say, molds the personality. <laughs> Trav, as usual, you've been a big help. Mm -hmm. Write a letter of commendation to my superiors. <laughs> My client, Moody, didn't exactly like explaining the discrepancy between 50000 and 200000 200000 was stolen from me. You're still avoiding my question. Moody, I want to know. Why did you only charge Phoenix with stealing a measly 50000 in your original police complaint? I had, uh, private reasons. Now, if I'm to come through for you, I can't be in the dark. Well, the bulk of the money was a sum I couldn't afford to broadcast publicly. Whatever that means... You're in export-import, huh? Yeah, export-import. Export-import is a pretty broad heading. It could cover a lot of operations, above board and underhanded, legitimate goods and contraband of some kind. Let it go at that. Cash deals in the dark, no record of it on the books. Stop making out a case. A fraud against the government, tax evasion. Keep it up, we'll have a parting of the ways. I'm not on trial with you, Craig. I like to know the character of my client. I'm honest and dishonest. What's so unusual about that? Every second guy you meet. Yeah, yeah. The buck for its own sake. No wonder the old world's in a spin. Phoenix took advantage of my sensitive situation. He knew in advance you could never prosecute him for the whole sum of money he stole. That you couldn't come into the courts with clean hands. Yeah, that was Phoenix's gimmick. You going to use any of this against me? Ask me that when we're counting your 200,000. Now, what answer... Oh, I get it. When you're counting your 5% fee, you mean. Sure. You like money like everybody else. Now, tell me something. Uh, who is Candy? I don't know. Never heard the name. An alias, maybe. Now, you recognize this description? Well built, little on the short side. Five feet seven, say. Brown hair, brown eyes. Natty dresser. The description means absolutely nothing to me. That's funny. Here's a guy who knows you well enough to be scrambling for your money. Well, it's a mystery to me. Leave a side of beef exposed and the jackals come around. Jackals and jackasses? Okay, I'll circulate around. Craig. What? The way you cross-examined me before, like a cop, not a confidential operator on my payroll. So? Don't double-cross me. Or? I'm not stupid. And I'm not helpless. Put it on the line, Modi. Be a cop with me after all? I'll kill you. I'm sure you could. Well? Well, what? Reassure me that you're still confidential. I did that. I'd only be lying. Meaning? I'm not working for you anymore. You're off the case? I didn't say that. Then it is a double cross. Clean hands. I only like clients with clean hands. So long, Modi. Craig, stay out of my business. Your kind of business, Moody, is public business. Oh, they happen like that. A case where you dump a client midstream. Where from confidential cop you change to Boy Scout. You're working without fee in the public wheel and welfare. Great. Only it doesn't buy any groceries. At the Kilgore Hotel over in Brooklyn Heights, I got Canby's room number from the desk clerk. I also got an advance hint on how frantic it could get up in Canby's room. I spied the desk clerk on the telephone a second after I started for the staircase. The desk clerk tipping Canby off to my visit. There'd be a gun upstairs waiting to greet me. What kind of a hotel was it? It was that kind of a hotel. 
In the hall outside Candy's room, I had a scheme to outmaneuver Candy's gun. Candy? Frank Candy? Yeah, what is it? Linen service. I got your fresh linen. Yes, ma'am. I flattened against the side wall of the hall, out of line of fire, and waited for Candy to open the door. Come right in. Hey! It's my turn to shoot now. Oh! Uh. In his room, Canby revived before the police ambulance I'd phoned for showed up. Uh, you think fast, Craig. I have to, to keep alive. How bad? Thigh wound. I only shot to immobilize you. Very considerate. You'll live for newer and bigger swindles. When you're free again, that is. You've got no charge against me. The Sullivan Law, that gun you carry. And armed assault on me. Going to pour it on, huh? Depends, maybe, on how you cooperate. Cooperate how? Frank talk. Ask me. Where do you come in on Moody's missing 200000 I forced myself in. Meaning? Well, I'm out of left field. I don't know Moody and I don't know Phoenix. But I do know about the dough, you understand me? I think so. You freelance in crime. You're a fly. Honey anywhere draws you. That's it, yeah. Got a prison record? So far, no. Been lucky, huh? Until you. Who tried to detain me for you in Sooner Falls? Hutch. Who is he? The next pug. Blackballed out of boxing for throwing fights. He hires out to me. You got away from him, huh? I out-wrestled him. I was afraid of that. Afraid you'd get the phone ahead to New York. Hutch is a pin brain. You hired him. You should have knocked me off on that train. Yeah, I second guess it that way, too. Only, uh... Only? Murder. I shy away from it. You shot at me out in the hall. I shot to nick you, slow you up. Well, what are we waiting for? Police ambulance. Snake eyes for you, Canby. You're out of the game. Pass the dice. With Canby out of the game, I set out to eliminate another player. Rita. I found her in the dining room of the Park Front Hotel. She didn't bat an eyelash when I joined her at the table, like she was immune to surprise. You, hmm? Me. Oh, what's good? Chicken fricassee. What's new? Canby's in the clink. Thanks. For what? Removing Canby. He's been giving me a bad time. Asking you where he can find Johnny Phoenix? Asking me? Where can I find Johnny Phoenix? I'm deaf. Stupid. Maybe. You're crazy if you keep dreaming of that money. I've stopped dreaming. Meaning? My husband gave me the brush. Johnny wants a divorce. What does Johnny say about the hidden loot? Not a word to me. What do you say about the loot? Meaning? Us? No deal. I get the money, I kiss it once. Then? Hand it over to the authorities to be held in escrow for Jip Moody. Now, where do I find Johnny Phoenix? Expect me to tell you? You might, seeing Johnny's read you out of his life. 742 Bond Street, a rooming house. Johnny's holed up there. When you surprise him, tell him you're there by courtesy of Rita. Rita without love. <laughs> 742 Bond Street, I finally got back with Johnny Phoenix. Funny thing, though, Phoenix didn't seem to care a bit. The money, Craig, I, I don't want it. Because keeping it is too hard? No, the fellow who stole it, I'm no longer him. I've had therapy. I've got a different focus now. Whole new plan for living. You sound like a walking testimonial for prison psychiatry. Oh, I feel lighter. I don't walk, I bounce. You know what I've done these two days? I've been free. What? Read books. Gone to church, looked through the one ad. Hooray for the new man. So where's the dough hidden? Buried in an empty lot in Long Island. Town named Fullerton, where I grew up as a kid. I'll drive you there. Let's go. In Fullerton, we ran into a surprise. No empty lot. I... I don't recognize the setting. You've been away five years. Just what's different? 
Well, what you see, the house standing there, that, uh, that Cape Cod. You say the house there was built on the empty lot you buried the money in? Yeah, the exact spot. There are markers around. I recognize that, that clump of trees there. I counted 20 paces north and two paces east. Then I buried the money. That would put the money smack in the middle of the foundation of the house. What do we do now? How deep did you dig five years ago? Six feet. In building the house, an excavation of at least 12 feet was made. Meaning uh, the money was exposed to the builder? Meaning. You wait here. I'm going to make some inquiries inside the house. Yeah, but what possible good? Inquiries inside the house. Inquiries around Fullerton, generally. Then some research into police files. I'm curious as to why a house was built on that exact spot. Badly chosen location in a lowland where rains create a swampland. And with the nearest town neighbor, east, west, north, and south, at least 200 yards away. Wait here, Phoenix. <laughs> I made my inquiries, nosed around, did my research. The following day, I dropped in to see Trev Rogers to tell him who to go arrest. I'm to arrest a homeowner in a town on Long Island called Fullerton. That's right. A homeowner named Cy Canaday. Cy Canaday, alias Joe Califf. The name falls on deaf ears, huh? Should I know it? A cop should. I could send you pouring through police files on Johnny Phoenix. Spare me the toil. Police headquarters assigned stool pigeons and plants to the asylum Phoenix was confined in. Yes? I have the names of the miscellaneous and sundry plants and stoolies here. Abram, Tyler, Wilson, Mackenzie, Caliph. Is it uh, beginning to dawn? Yes, Caliph. Joe Caliph. A professional stool pigeon the department employed years ago. A stool pigeon who spent time in a prison asylum with Johnny Phoenix. Time enough to pump Phoenix and get himself a road map to a bonanza. Double-cross the police department. You always take that chance when you engage stool pigeons. It's a calculated risk. Caliph dug up the money in Fullerton, then had a contractor build him a house right over the exact spot for him. A weird device, kind of? The house? Caliph's calculated risk to make the quest for the money look hopeless. The money was lost to the ironies in a housing excavation. He never thought anybody would be shrewd enough to look behind his alias of Canada, respectable homeowner and family man at this late date. But you did. I might not have. All the time I was making inquiries, I was sure I was wasting time. Cases, Trav, sometimes hang on, that slimmer thread. So... Make the arrest. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Schemers, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Man Who Wanted to Be Guilty, about which Barry Craig has this to say. What did the man want to be guilty of? Murder, of course. And he discovered that all you had to do to accomplish that was to kill someone. But he had a little trouble. Listen and find out about it, hmm? Good night, folks. See you next week. National Broadcasting Company has just brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Rita was Terry Keene. Don Pardo speaking. It's another exciting dragnet adventure tonight on the NBC Radio Network.